Hello, this is just a supplemental podcast for the Theorising Social Life module, looking at the concept of money as a social phenomenon, which we started to touch upon in class, but ran out of time due to uh, going off onto various debates and discussions. So this is just picking up on the uh, subjects that we would have spoken about in class if we had the time. The chief angle that we're going to come at it from is with the theories of Jörg Simmel. There, there are other people who have also philosophized about the role of money in society, but um, it's, it's his ideas and those of uh, Noah Yuval Harari that we'll be looking at as we go along. Um, so Simmel wrote a uh, seminal text on the matter called Philosophy of Money in the year 1900 in which he explored his ideas around money and we won't touch on every single thing he said clearly because we'd be here forever but some of his key concepts and ideas we'll explore as we go along um, first off to put it in the context of his more overarching ideas his um, approach to society was that communities are a, a creation of human imagination we come together in a village, a town, a, a city, an entire country, an entire nation, an entire empire, as the case may be, whatever level of, of um, organization you want to look at, uh, and interrelate to each other. Our social institutions like um, marriage, education, religion, the workplace, banking, all sorts of things are a product of human imagination. Um, part of growing up in a society or indeed moving to a brand new society and then learning to fit within its systems is that we internalize the imaginal structure in which created that society in the first place. So um, let's say you've emigrated to a new part of the world, you are learning the laws of that part of the world, you're learning the different social institutions, what's the holidays and big festivals of the year, what are the ethical beliefs, the religious outlooks, how do they view family life, all sorts of things you learn as you go along, you, whether you agree with them or not, and there may be bits of it you like and bits of it you don't like, but you learn what they are, and so those ideas become part of your internalised world. And then you kind of carry around a, a miniature version of society in your own consciousness. And it operates within you. So even if you were to, let's say, be stranded on a desert island or something bizarrely melodramatic, you would still take your ideas of what society ought to be, what it's like, how to live your life with you, even when there's nobody else around to enforce it or encourage it or enable it. It's because it's within you. It's a concept in your mind. And it's difficult to move away from that once it's inside you. Now, he also spoke extensively about the idea of power and challenged that rather Marxist point of view that power is rigid. Uh, the, the Marxist point of view, which has become uh, a central feature of things like critical race theory and both Marxist and radical feminism and to a point postmodern feminism as well, is the view that uh, there are these very rigid power structures in society in which there are some sections of society who are in the elite group, the ones with considerable power and influence to do as they please. And then there are the demographic groups in society who have either no power whatsoever or at least much less power and are kept in an oppressed state because they have considerably less power. Uh, Simmel didn't uh, agree with the rigidity of the idea, although he, he did um, go along with this idea of social power, but rather saw it as a more dynamic, fluid concept. That power can exist in all sorts of ways and be assessed in all sorts of routes, and that it's very rarely completely static. Rarely, indeed, if ever, completely static. So that um, a person with a great deal of power today might not have much power tomorrow, and vice versa it's moving and shifting all over the place. So um, as per the inset photo, for those two of you too young to know who those um, characters are, uh, that's um, Hugh Laurie and Stephen Fry going back a few decades when they appeared in a TV version of the Jeeves and Wooster novels. 
which are uh, the, the joke of the Jeeves and Mooster novels, is that the rich, young, upper-class man, the one with theoretically all the wealth, the power, the status, the influence, the clout, is as thick as two short planks. And his valet, the servant, the employee, the put-upon drudge, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the man from the working classes, although he would not have, I mean, Jeeves would not have considered himself working class, but the, um, the person doing all the actual cooking and cleaning and scrubbing and all the hard work in the house, is the really clever one and it's Jeeves who gets his master out of no end of trouble and no end of shtick. It's also a bit of a running joke that Jeeves is a much bigger snob than his, his employer is uh, and much more concerned with the social niceties than um, Bertie Wooster is. Uh, and so that idea of what might appear a very one-sided power relationship, the very rich employer to the probably underpaid employee, the upper class to the um, working or, or at absolute best lower middle class um, employee is very, would seem to be from a Marxist point of view, very rigid and suffocating and oppressive. But the, the actual power dynamic is much more fluid because Jeeves's power resides in things other than money. Um, you've got suggestions of various types of power, which both Simmel and various other thinkers and philosophers over the years have focused on. So Jeeves's power derives from his knowledge. He is he's incredibly intelligent, entirely self-educated, um, knows a great deal more about every subject under the sun than his highly educated uh, employer who's been to public school and all the rest of it. Jeeves is the brains of the outfit. And he uses his knowledge, his expertise, his understanding of human relationships, his ability to solve all manner of dilemmas and problems that arise in the, le the, 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 um, the length of the stories, to exert himself in a sense, not only over his employer, but all, over all of the other upper class twits that are, are characters in the stories. He is the one in charge. Uh, and so it's not just money as a form of power or social status. Um, being a member of the upper classes, that's a form of power. There are lots of other types of power as well. And, and different writers and, and sociologists, philosophers, etc., have mulled over some of these other types of power. Um, people can have sexual allure. They know that somebody else fancies them rotten and they're able to wrap that person around their little finger and do as they please with them in a sense. Um, there are people for whom money is their chief source of power, people for whom their talent in a given area is their chief source of power, uh, all sorts of other ways of assessing power and those power dynamics shift and change both within a relationship like the, the, the employer-employee relationship that Jews and Mooster has but also as we have a network of different relationships in our lives, friends, family, co-workers, people whose services we might hire briefly to um, fix the electrics or repair the plumbing or what have you. People who come and go in our lives at different points and junctures, there will be some over whom we have power and some where they have the greater power, at least at a given point in time, and some where we're roughly on parity with each other. And quite how we understand that power will depend on all sorts of contingencies and so it's a much subtler thing than the rather prosaic Marxist view. And, and so Simmel has a lot more nuance to offer within his ideas and theories. And we'll focus chiefly on the money angle but those other angles might interest you and be something you want to talk about in class perhaps. So sticking with the money angle, um, he argues that once money developed, and if you go back to various points in history and still some places in the world, um, money isn't the only means of doing business. A lot of places use barter and trade, for example, where somebody says, I'll swap my sack of potatoes for your cow, which doesn't sound like a very good bargain, actually. <laughs> um, people swapping goods or swapping services, you know, I'll dig your garden for an hour if you come and paint my spare bedroom for an hour, that sort of thing. So there's different, money is only one route of trade, but it's the one we'll, we'll focus on here. Simmel's argument is that money exists as an imaginal thing. 
a metal disc or a rectangle of paper has no real value in and of itself, except within the imagination of the people who use it. So we, we have a, a faith in these banknotes and coins that they represent something meaningful and real. The idea that they have some objective measurable worth, that they are something worth chasing after. And so they enter into the imaginal realm and go beyond their material reality of bits of metal and bits of paper. All that weird plasticky stuff that we have nowadays um, with the, the kind of banknotes in circulation at present. Um, they also are works of art in the sense they exist in an artistic context. So the, the designs of the banknotes and the images stamped onto the coins, which is why people collect coins and banknotes, because they are things of beauty in and of themselves, things of interest. But that's a slightly separate issue. Similar argues that there's this, this curious process that's gone through, which does have some rooting in Freudian theory, if we stray briefly into the world of psychology, but we'll keep the focus here on sociological concepts chiefly. Um, a person makes an object. So let's say uh, I go and bake a cake, for argument's sake. And I want to sell my cake that I have made. So the, the act of making a cake, I've created this, this thing, and I'm then attributing a financial value to it. And I'm hoping when I take it down to the market to sell, that at least one of the, the people who walks past my market store will consider the amount of money I'm charging to be equivalent to the value of the object I'm selling. So if I'm charging five quid for a cake, they'll think that actually that cake is definitely worth five quid. Some of them might think the cake looks awful and isn't worth nearly as much. And some of them might think the cake looks really wonderful and they'd actually be prepared to pay more. And they think they've got themselves a bit of a bargain that they only have to fork out five quid. And so again, there is a, a sort of an imaginal process going on there where I look at the object I've made, the cake, and potential customers look at it. Um, we are all engaged in the process of working out what is this worth? How many coins, how many notes is this thing worth? There's what I think it's worth and there's what these varied customers coming and going think it's worth. Uh, and there's no objective value to the item, to the cake, until the moment someone buys it. So if I'm charging a five quid and not one single person wants to buy the damn cake, in what sense is it actually worth five quid because no one's given me five quid for it? It's a useless article and of course being a cake, it won't last very long before it starts to go wrong. So the period of time during which it is worth five quid is quite limited compared to some object that would last a much longer period. Um, at the moment when somebody says, lovely smashing, here's a fiver, I'll take that cake off you, then the reality of the value is realized. But until that moment happens, the, the value is more theoretical than actual. I've got rid of my cake. I've sold it. I've got that five quid in my back pocket. This is a process of, of seeking and attaining value. And Simmel argues that there is a kind of a distancing and an attaining going on, not necessarily between me and the cake, but between me and the value. Why do I think that cake is worth five quid? Well, a number of things. There's the materials the cake is made from, the flour, the sugar, the eggs, the butter, the rest of it. I, maybe I've, I've had to buy them, or maybe some of them I was, you know, I could have chickens in the backyard, so I've got the eggs from the chickens or whatever. So I, I, I'm evaluating the processes evolved, involved in the, in the acquisition of the raw materials. Then I'm thinking, how long did it take me to bake the cake? And so my time acquires a financial value. There's also the knowledge that I, I have this knowledge, this skill of how to bake a cake. How did I get that knowledge? Did I just read a cookbook? Did I go to cookery school and train for donkey's years to learn how to make a cake? And perhaps the amount of effort, time, money it cost me to acquire the knowledge 
will be reflected in the price tag I put on it. So if I was some terribly famous celebrity chef who'd studied cookery for 10 years, I might want a lot more for my cake than if I've just plucked a book off the shelf and followed the recipe and I don't, I've never formally studied cooking, I'm just going along with the recipe in the book. So it, again, my knowledge, my, my insights, my abilities or total lack of them will all help to shape a notion of what is this object worth? Because this object is a culmination of the raw materials, the manufacturing time, the knowledge, the skills, the abilities, my status, am I a big famous celebrity chef or am I some obscure nobody that no one's ever heard of? All of that goes into deciding whether that cake is worth five quid or 25 quid. So uh, am I also part of it, of course, again, is my perception of what other people are prepared to pay for it. Because if I decide that cake is worth a hundred pounds, but I know perfectly well I'm not going to find anyone crazy enough to pay a hundred quid for a cake, then is it really worth a hundred pounds? Because I'm not going to get that sum of money for it. So I might have to drop the value of the cake to a point where I'm reasonably confident somebody else, some stranger, would be prepared to fork over that amount of money. So there's a kind of a negotiated value between what I'd like to get for it and what I realistically think I probably will get for it. So all of those processes are going along in my head. And once I've got that five quid in my back pocket, that five quid at one level is just a piece of paper or a handful of coins. It's not worth anything per se until I go and spend it. Once I'm spending it, then whatever I'm trading that, that handful of coins in for, let's say I go and buy a book, for argument's sake, then there is an equivalency going on. The, the, the cake and the time and the effort and the flour and the sugar and the, the training and this, that, the other that went into creating that cake is the equivalent of the book I've just bought. Because the money from one provided the other. And the money is the, the translation process. That handful of coins is the translation process of cake to book. Now, the, the author of that book, Agatha Christie, or whoever it happens to be, would they see the value of their book as equivalent to the value of a cake? Well, I, well in the case of Agatha Christie, she's dead, so that's a new point. But you know, theoretically, if she was still alive, would she see the value of the book as equivalent to the cake? Maybe not. But then it's not her per se selling the book. Yes, she gets a cut of the royalties, but it's the bookshop that sells the book. And they've got it off the publisher. So the publisher sold it to the bookshop and the bookshop sells it to me at a markup. So again, who determines the value of something isn't necessarily always the person creating the thing in question, which is to some extent at least part draws on the Marxist notion of, of alienation within the workplace if the person making a thing is not the person setting the price of it and selling it. The manufacturer, the creator of the article gets their cut, but they are not the one in charge of the retail process. So it, there is a, a sort of a stepping away to somebody else, whether it's the bookshop owner or the publishing firm or whoever, that's stepping into that process. Now, when I'm setting that five quid price tag, it's already said, part of it is how much is my time worth? It takes me half hour to make the cake. Half hour of my time is worth five quid. Well, actually it's worth less than five quid because part of that price tag is not only the time, it's also the, the flour and the sugar and the eggs and the stuff. So a percentage of that five quid is a reflection of my time and the value of my time. Because I could have been doing all sorts of other things with that half hour, but I've made this cake instead. So I put a price tag on my time and the goal to earn money is valuing my time. It's, it's rather than doing other things with that time, I'm chasing money with it. But more specifically, I'm chasing the things I intend to do with the money once I've got it. Whether that's pay my bills or buy books or 
clothes or cars or whatever the hell it is that I'm chasing after. There, there is a, a sort of a, a chasing process, which is part of what Simul is talking about here. Um, although there are some other subtleties to it beyond that, but we'll, we'll keep it relatively simple for the moment. Um, in terms of the customer, what they value, what they chase after, what they're prepared to pay, partly it's down to obviously how much money you've got in your, your wallet in the first place. You can't pay what you haven't got unless you're prepared to go into debt. Part of the value of is this cake worth five quid or a hundred quid or whatever else involves processes by customers, potential customers, around their own resources and around the object they might desire to attain and how much they're prepared to fork out for it. And part of that valuing is this sense of whether it's easy to attain or not easy to attain. Simmel argues that things that are very easy to attain, we are usually less willing to fork out large sums for. We want at a cheaper rate. In a similar sense that things that come easily to a person tend to be less valued by them. So to give you an example, let's say you've got someone who is remarkably beautiful or handsome and they're always being pursued by women or men or, or both as the case may be. Uh, and you know, wherever they go, they, there's people swooning and going weak at the knees and chucking themselves at this, this stunning vision of beauty that's just walked into the room. Is that individual who can command sexual attention at the snap of a finger likely to value the sexual attention they get quite as much as the desperately shy, lonely, not terribly attractive person who can go for months or years without anyone showing the slightest bit of romantic interest in them. And so on the one occasion somebody does show interest in them because it's such a rarity, will they value it that much more highly? Whereas the person who, who can get romance or sex or whatever at the drop of a knicker elastic, would it, would it be a case of easy come, easy go? And, and, and it, it lacks the, um, the value to them, so they'll make less effort to get it, less effort to hold on to it, because they know it's easily replaceable. So in the sense, if I buy a bar of chocolate for 50p, and on the walk home I drop it accidentally in, in the street, and get home and realise I've lost it, am I going to be so depressed I throw myself off a bridge? Well, no, because I know I can easily afford to go to the shops tomorrow and buy another bar of chocolate for 50p and try and be a bit more careful with that one. It's an easily replaceable commodity and of a price where I, not, not only is there plenty of chocolate bars in the shop, but at a price where I can easily afford to buy another one. If I were to go and buy a Ferrari, Lord knows I'd do that on my wages, but if I were to go and do that and inexplicably mislaid the Ferrari on the way home and lost it, that would be a lot more gutting because I know how hard it would be to replace the Ferrari. Yes, there are other ones in the world at other garages, but it would, it costs such a phenomenal amount of money that it would take me an eternity to save up to buy another one. And so if I had that exceedingly expensive sports car, I'd value it way more than the cheap and cheerful chocolate bar. Simul flags up that for the People whose wage packets, like most teachers, don't stretch to flash sports cars may have a, a sort of a theoretical value for the object, but they don't have a realistic value. Because you look at something that's so unattainable, so way beyond your price range, that you might daydream about the thing, but it, it never really enters your head as a, a viable possibility in the list of things that you might want and might invest your money in. You wouldn't even bother to start saving up for that £100,000 sports car because you know there's no way on earth you're ever going to get £100,000 to pay for it. And if you did miraculously have £100,000, there's probably lots of other things that you would need to get first. And so that sports car will be way at the bottom of a long, long, long list. Uh, and so the more unattainable a thing is, the less real value it has. Equally, the, the cheaper and more easy to attain a thing is, 
the less realistic value it has. It's the things somewhere in the middle that has real value. And that value is not simply the price tag put upon it, but the, the mental, psychological, the emotional investment in wanting the object, attaining the object, keeping hold of the object, preserving it, not wasting it or not letting it get damaged or lost or whatever. All of which reflects these elements of value listed on the screen there. Um, the harder something is to get, the more you're likely to value it, unless it's so impossibly hard, it's just a pipe dream beyond your own capacities to attain to. The value of a work is something which Simmel rather like Marx drawing upon those ideas of alienation in the workplace once again, considers in, in a sense devalued by the notion of money. So let's say the chap in the photo that is sculpting this very impressive statue and it takes him I don't know, months, months and months and months to make the, the statue and it's a thing of beauty and he's probably trained for donkey's years to learn how to carve a statue out of marble and, and it's a phenomenal thing. I could never carve a statue out of marble like that. If I had a go it would just be a pile of rubble. That's an amazing thing to do. But when he's going chisel, chisel, chisel for months and months and months and then creating that statue. Is he ultimately thinking of the price tag? How much money he will be able to sell it for and what he'll do with that money. He'll pay the rent, he'll pay the phone bill, he'll go on holiday, he'll stock the cupboards with food, he'll do this, that and the other. So is he valuing the art in and of itself? Art for art's sake, if you like. Is the, is the value of the art his skill, his talent, the beauty of the piece, how much people ooh and are when they see it, how inspirational they find it, how inspirational he finds it? Is it the, the, the all those wonderful insubstantial things? Or, because this is what he does for a living, is it the cold hard cash? And Simmel's argument is that when it becomes the cold hard cash, which it's going to be in the, in the vast majority of cases, the thing created, the work of art, starts to lose its more subtle, more sublime value as a thing of beauty, at least in the eyes of the person creating it. It may be a thing of beauty to the person who buys it, you don't know it is at any rate, but to the person creating it, investing their blood, sweat and tears in it, it's less and less this work of wonder and more and more a means to a financial end. And therefore there's something beautiful lost in the process. Uh, and this is a knock-on consequence of, well, Simmel, Simmel will probably say knock-on consequence of the capitalist system. But even if you lived in a communist system or a socialist system or whatever, there's, there's still money involved. So there's always going to be this sense of, am I doing creating beauty for the sake of beauty or am I creating beauty in order to pay the rent? no matter what kind of economic system you live under. That's always going to be a question to pose. It'd be interesting to hear if you feel there is a sense of, of loss. And it's not just the creation of art. Let's say you are employed to uh, be a doctor or a nurse or a care worker, and you're looking after someone in their most vulnerable hour when they're ill and weak and frail and what have you. Are you there to perform this act of great compassion for another human being to be kind and caring and enter into this most fundamental of human relationships or are you there for the catch and no matter how much you do genuinely care for that person and do your best to look after them in the period you're with them at the end of the day if you didn't get your wage packet you'd be off of course you would be you'd have to go and earn your wage somewhere else and so again not just works about any kind of interaction creation relationship where a price tag enters into it, a wage packet enters into it, is something lost by the introduction of money. Something to mull over. Um, Harari we've mentioned a couple of times in previous classes, but he 
goes off at a, a bit of a tangent from the kinds of ideas Simmons had here, but sticking with this notion of money being an example of something in the imaginal realms, he says that money, or more specifically capitalism in general, has become rather like a religion. In that a religion is a, in its loosest definition, is a belief in something greater and grander than the individual self. Um, as per the quote there, it has this system of values um, and the belief in something superhuman, or we could say perhaps transhuman, something beyond the individual human, something bigger, grander, longer lasting. Which sounds a bit grandiose and overblown when you first hear it, perhaps, but if we break this down to think about it, in a sense, as what does he actually mean? The coins, the notes, are a symbol, we've said this already. They're, they are a symbolic transaction between each one of us and the world around us. We trade time, we trade material goods, we trade all sorts of things for money. And that money has a value which outlasts the individual. So um, when I write my last will and testament, leaving not only material possessions like books and statues and things and that, but leaving whatever's left in my bank account come my last gasping hour to friends, to relatives, to charities and what have you, the money lasts longer than I do. And when my will is carried out, that money is distributed by a solicitor or whoever is in charge of distributing the money once I'm dead. Then my wishes are lasting longer than my flesh and blood. And my wishes are chiefly being articulated and expressed in the financial terms. Now you could say I, I can also have wishes about my funeral. I might say, well, I want this music played at my funeral. I want people to dress in puce or something rather than in black and for the duration of my funeral which I mean half hour or what have you um, my wishes continue to be carried out but that's a short-lived thing if I donate a couple of thousand pounds to a charity that couple of thousand pounds can go on being spent and hopefully doing some good for days weeks months years after I'm dead and buried and rotting away in the ground uh, and so there, there is almost a sense of, if not full-on long-term immortality, there is at least a sense in which money is giving me a life after death. It's enabling me to have a presence in the world when actually I'm not in the world anymore. Uh, this is kind of what Harari is talking about, that there is a quality to money which connects us not just with other living people, but with, with dead people. So if we've inherited money from some aged relative who's died, then that money connects us to them, just as our money will connect us to other people when we die and leave our money to them. It's a, it's a bonding, uh, a, a linking phenomenon, which goes beyond the individual. And all the more so, Harari says, in this day and age when most banking is electronic. So it's no longer even simply faith in bits of paper and bits of coin, bits of bits of metal. It's faith in blips on a on a screen somewhere. But when you're you log on to the bank website and it burbles away and it tells you there's five pound fifty in your bank account, that you believe it that that is real. That that five pound fifty, even though it's just a few electronic blips on the screen, has some reality to it some substance to it. It's a faith in the very notion, the very concept of money. He also goes on to make comparisons between cathedrals and shopping centres, or if you want to be terribly American, shopping malls, as being these places of, of grandeur in terms of how they're built to, to impress. You go into a cathedral or a, a, a huge great mosque or an old synagogue or a Hindu mandir or whatever, and the architecture is phenomenal. It is designed to awe you, to give you a sense of divinity and wonder and vastness and age and endurance and, and mystery. And whilst it's a bit hyperbolic to say quite the same thing about a shopping centre, nonetheless there is an intent to impress. 
that you go in and you think, oh, this is luxurious, this is big and it's grand and it's ornate and there's all of these shops and there's lights and there's colours and there's maybe the smell of coffee and baking coming from a coffee shop and all this kind of thing. It, it's, it's not exactly the smell of incense in a church, but it is a, a sensory experience which is intended to overwhelm the individual and you feel you're in this big grand place where you and hundreds or thousands of other people are going and just as traditionally every Sunday vast numbers turn up at church or every Friday vast numbers at synagogue that there are shopping centers where huge numbers of people go on their days off the days when they're not chained to a desk or toiling away in the factory or wherever it is that they work they go to visit the shopping center and they're not just going the way i do when i go into shop i'm in and out in five minutes because i hate shopping and i want to be over and done with as quickly as possible people go to shopping centers for an experience they'll go and traipse from shop to shop to shop to shop looking at all manner of tact most of which they won't buy but they want to go whilst they're looking at it and be dazzled by the variety of possibilities. Maybe they'll stop off for a coffee, maybe they'll have something to eat, maybe they'll sit on a bench for 10 minutes and rest their feet before the next trek round, the next three dozen shots. And they'll traipse home at the end of the day with 56 bags jammed full of crap they can't afford. Uh, and they've got this sense of, of having participated in some cultural experience in a sense some sort of bonding phenomena either with the other friends and relatives they've gone shopping with or simply with the random strangers they've passed in the shopping center uh, and so it becomes this this kind of ritualistic experience uh, and in lockdown periods when people haven't been able to go out as much it's perhaps emphasizes the fact that when they do finally get to go to the shops it's almost like an exciting trip out the house because they've been so bored out their box during lockdown that suddenly going to a clothes shop or a bookshop or a, a grocery shop or something is a bit of a thrill. It's a bit of an experience. And just as priests and rabbis and imams and what have you promise all sorts of wondrous benefits from turning up for worship, so the, the um, owners of various shops promise you that they're doing you favours by selling you the latest goods. Buy this face cream, it'll make you look years younger. Spray your nether regions with this um, eau de cologne and women or men or what have you will fawn over you in great numbers. Buy this this article of clothing, you'll look half the weight and you'll, you'll look stylish and elegant and you'll get through your job interviews. Buy all this tack we're selling and all sorts of wonderful things will happen for you. The Harari is a little bit, little bit jaded in his view of religion and equally is somewhat jaded in his view of these empty offers. These, these vacuous promises made by shop owners uh, and we're not obviously talking about Mrs. Jones who owns a corner shop, we're talking about people who own vast retail enterprises the length and breadth of the country in a similar sense that say the the Anglican Church owns thousands and thousands of churches all over the country and so you can go and participate in the Anglican Communion at any one of 5,000 churches so you can go and participate in the Sainsbury's experience at any one of umpty thousand Sainsbury's outlets the length and breadth of the country and just as a churches tend to look quite similar to each other in layout and design and where the altar is and all this sort of thing. So one Tesco's to a point is much the same as any others in that they're replicating an experience. And whilst the individual shape of a particular shop, maybe one shop is a bit different from another shop, there is that kind of similarity of experience of going into one tes a Tesco's in Ipswich is not dissimilar to going into a Tesco's in Glasgow in terms of the layout of the building and the kinds of things they sell and all the rest of it. In much the same way that going to one mosque, it's not dissimilar to going to a mosque in Ipswich to a mosque in Glasgow, because the, the experience is intended to be fundamentally the same. Uh, and so 
Harari's argument in part is that as the world has got more and more secularized and religion has been elbowed into a corner somewhat, the, the new religion, if we can call it that, the secular religion, is shopping. And more fundamentally than shopping, it's money. Buying, um, acquiring it, spending it, getting it, giving it, checking your bank statements, rolling around in the amount of money you've got there, or panicking because there isn't enough there. Money is this, this new kind of communal experience. And just as people have, have, since the year dot, put money in the collection plate in churches and temples, so you go into shops and you put money in the plate. And maybe, as particularly again lockdown, we hear about shop after shop after shop gone bankrupt and gone into closure because of lack of income. But on the occasions when you do get to go to the shops and spend a bit of money there, especially if it's a local, a small scale shop rather than a chain store, maybe you feel as if you're kind of spending your five quid, you're, you're doing something socially constructive because you're keeping that little shop open. So it will be there for you to go back to next time. And so you make your donation up on the plate. They're almost like making an offering in a church or a temple. That there is a, a sort of a ritualistic transaction to the experience. By extension, are the um, characters like Lord Sainsbury's and Lord Tesco's are they the high priests and high priestesses of the new religion? Harari argues that banks have this same grandeur about them, at least the big central banks do, if not the little local branches. Um, you know, that they, they, they don't want just prosaic workaday buildings, they want buildings that are quite grand and quite impressive. Uh, and they've got that air of, of um, Gringotts Bank about them in Harry Potter. You know, they're, they're looking to impress. So when you go into the big banks, there is a sense of ooh about it. And they're, they're the people who work there are dressed in uniforms. And you have to queue up and you have to behave with a certain decorum. And there is a, a kind of a ritualism. And going to have a meeting with your bank manager on bended knee to ask for a loan is rather like going into the confessional to ask for forgiveness. It's this, this, this sort of reverential act. And so the banker becomes the priest becomes all you know the, the, the bankers at the top level are the high priests the the archbishops and the cardinals and so forth the grandiose figures of reverence people who work as economists whether in a bank or for a think tank or for a government you know, chancellors of the exchequer that sort of thing um, economic theory harari argues is in the realm of religion, these grandiose theories about almost just as a religion they espouse his ideas about the afterlife and you never quite know whether they're true or not until you're dead and then it's too late to say one way or the other. Economists have grandiose theories about how global economics work and they no more have to prove those grandiose theories than uh, a church or a temple has to prove its theories about the afterlife. They are notions taken on faith. Harari also goes on to talk about the concept of what actually constitutes money and he does a bit of a historical overview in one of his books as to how societies moved from barter and trade into developing a money, monetary system and not only how they did it but more relevantly to this discussion why they did it. Um, so different cultures that, you know, pe have traded in various different things not just coins as we understand them today but various other things have been used in the place of money. So it's not specifically whether it's banknotes or coins, but just the very concept of it. That it's a thing you use to um, exchange for goods and for services. So again, we're back to Simmel's argument of money as a, a product of the imaginal realms, more so than it is the actual physical bit of metal or physical um, rectangle of paper. Harari's argument is that Historically, in this country, when we used to barter, and some parts of the world still do, there's a lot of haggling and negotiation. Is my bag of spuds worth your goat? Or do you want two bags of spuds, or three bags of spuds? Or whatever? So we haggle back and forth, 
and whether or not we do a trade depends on whether you even want a bag of spuds in the first place. I might want your goat, but you might not want anything that I've got to trade for it. In which case, I have to, to you know, go away, in a sense. Um, whereas money, I I want your goat, I offer you amount of money for it, and you accept the amount of money. Does, you don't have to want my potatoes or my apples or my oranges or anything else, you just want the cold hard cash. Because you can then trade the cash for whatever it is that you do want, from somebody or another that sells the thing that you do want. So it then basically frees up trade to become much more diverse and widespread. And it's no longer a case of I only get your goat if I've got something that you want in exchange. Because if I've got money, then everyone wants the money. So that there is an element of, of um, the development of money is the development of a concept that expands who can sell what, who can exchange what, whether we're talking physical goods or whether we're talking services like being a plumber or a carpenter or an electrician or a doctor. The exchange of services and the exchange of goods is the, the, the wheels of a business are oiled by the invention of money as a replacement for trade. Um, and it achieves a sense of standardization as well. So if I go to the market and a bag of apples is a quid, then we know what value a pound is. It's not subjective. Whereas if it's trade, I want a bag of apples and I say, oh, I've got a bag of pears. Shall we swap apples for pears? And that person says, well, there's more apples in my bag than there's pears in your bag. Therefore, I want something else. We start to get into that haggling as to how many pears is, this, is the equivalent of how many apples. And what I think and what you think will vary a lot and when, if I come back in a week's time for more apples, you might have changed your mind as the, the apple seller as to quite what it is and how much it is you want in exchange. And so there's a lot of variability in that. Whereas a, a pound is a pound, a dollar is a dollar. And, and so there is some degree of consistency from one week to the next. And from the, the knowledge that if I've um, sold you something for two pounds, I can take that two pounds and I know roughly what I can exchange it for from any other trader. So it's whereas if I swapped my bag of apples for your bag of oranges, there's no guarantee what I can then swap that bag of oranges for with a different trader. I might get at what I want and I might not get at what I want. And it's, it's a lot more ambiguous. There's also this element of transportability. But if I um, swap a sack of coal for um, a bunch of logs. A bunch of logs is quite heavy. Like, and there's only so far I can cart a bunch of logs. It's not the easiest thing in the world to move around. Whereas a, a few coins or a few bits of paper in my wallet or purse is much easier to carry. Uh, and so money gives me something I could go a long distance with and not have to break my back carrying. Or if I swap a cow for a goat, again, goats, you, they're, they're, they're awkward things, they're herdable, they, they wander off. It's much easier to move a fistful of coins than it is to move half a dozen goats about the place. On the other hand, if I've just acquired through barter five goats, if I'm very clever and there's a mix of male and female goats, I could turn five goats into 25 goats in time by breeding them. If I've got five quid, well, if that five quid just sits in my wallet, it's not going to turn into 10 quid or 20 quid or 30 quid by magic. I could invest it, I could trade it, I could, could gamble with it and convert it into more money. But just all by itself, it's not going to reproduce. Whereas some forms of barter, not all forms clearly, but some forms potentially could be worth a lot more because I can I can breed more goats or more cows or more horses or whatever it is, plant seeds and grow more vegetables. So that there is a variability to that. Um, a flip side of that yet again is the fact that we may not see the replicability of something because we're focusing on the money. So if I go and buy an apple from a supermarket, I come home, I eat the apple. 
there's a load of pips in that apple. Now, do I use those pips? Do I plant them and grow an orchard? And obviously it will take a few years for, for trees to mature enough to produce fruit. But in the long term, I could go from having one apple to having 500 apples by planting the seeds and growing the trees, which then produce the 500 apples. Will I do that? Well, actually, I have done that. <laughs> That's because I'm weird. But the, obviously, most people who go and buy an apple from a supermarket will not go and plant an entire orchard from it. They'll, they'll eat the apple and throw the corn away and then go and buy another apple the next day and the next day and the next day. So they're not necessarily, and that obviously is a, a potential weakness of the monetary system, that we miss the trick that um, fruit and vegetables and things like that can self-replicate to the point where we wouldn't need to keep going back to the shops to buy more if we would bear in mind that we can grow the stuff. But we don't think in that way, we're just thinking in terms of the convenience of going back to the shop and getting what we want. And also, of course, these days, which is not directly to, related to money, it's more related to food production and storage. But the, back in the day when you had to eat what you could grow, food was seasonal. These days I can expect to eat strawberries in the middle of winter, if I want to. And so I, the, the money coupled with food production and food storage systems gives this sense of, I can have what I want when I want it, regardless, rather than having to only want what's available in a given season. And that has implications on the environment and on health and on all sorts of other things as well. Um, part of the notion of development of a society, Harari and Simmel argue, goes hand in glove with money. So back in the day, um, back before we had investment capitalism as a, an overt phenomena, most business was small scale business, small scale farming, small scale crafts. So that the, the craftsman or craftswoman who is, um, made a chair or woven some cloth, sells the chair, sells the cloth for profit, and that profit goes into feeding the family. Once that, um, investment capitalism system comes along, you've got people with large sums of money, which they've earned from doing various activities, who then choose to invest those large sums of money in buying up large scale production. And so it's no longer that kind of small scale production. It's someone who perhaps doesn't know how to weave cloth or how to make a chair, but has enough money that they can buy up the material resources and they build factories and have machines in the factories and then hire people to operate the machines and then they cr cream off very large sums of money. But what's the motivating issue to get from the small scale cottage industry to the large scale mass production? Well, Harari suggests the chief motivation is money. Also other things as well like power and status, but chiefly it's the want for more and more money. And when people get large sums of money more than they more money than they as such need to, to meet their bills and meet their kind of immediate living requirements, they start to think what else they can do with their money, what other directions can they invest it in. And so the money then generates changes in society. And we move from cottage industry into investment capitalism and, and so on. And it leads to bigger and bigger changes in society where a m money becomes a motivation in and of itself. So it's, it's less about, I want money in order to buy a new car. It's more, I want money in order to have a million pounds in the bank. Even if there's nothing specific that I want to do with that million pounds, I just want a million pounds in the bank. Uh, and so money becomes its own goal in and of itself. Adam Smith, back in the 1700s, who is regarded as the kind of founding father of capitalism in a sense, he literally wrote a book on it, argued that um, what is good for the supremely rich is good for everyone else because it trickles down. And Adam Smith is the, the, the one who gave us the, the very notion of trickle-down economics. So the the 
the tycoon comes along, buys a factory, employs 300 people to work in it, and makes a ton of money. So the ton of money is good for the tycoon, but it's also good, Smith argues at least, for the 300 people employed in the factory, because they're getting paid. And it's good for their families, because they're getting food on the table and the roof over their heads. Uh, and so rather than just viewing this, as Marxists would do, as a system of greed and exploitation by the few over the many, Smith, who is, if all, you could almost describe him as an anti-Marxist in a sense, he's the, the polar opposite of Marx, although he was alive before Marx was, but anyway, um, is arguing that money as a motivating factor in and of itself spreads. So not only have you got those people, 300 people in the factory being paid, but if that tycoon goes out and buys a flash car, then whoever made the flash car and sells the flash car, they benefit. And if the tycoon goes out and spends a ton of money on um, redecorating the house, then all of the people who sell the wallpaper and the paint and the ornaments and this, that and the other, and the, the, the painters and the decorators and all of the people involved in that whole process, they benefit. Conversely, if the tycoon sits on the money and just like Scrooge McDuck goes swimming in it, but never actually spends it because they're a miser, it's a bugger all benefit to anyone, at least until the, the miser dies and somebody else inherits the money. It's an argument that Ayn Rand took up, this notion that what is good for one person ultimately becomes good for others, and therefore the pursuit of self-interest, whether in terms of money or other issues, is for the benefit of society, because if I'm happy, that makes other people happy. And if what makes me happy is pursuing money, then I should pursue it, not only because I'll be spending some of it and splashing the cash, but also because it puts me in a good frame of mind and therefore I'm better to other people, kinder to other people. Which brings us to the end of this, this um, mini seminar or whatever you want to call it. Um, if you've got any questions, uh, by all means email them to me, or if you're happy to wait until the next lecture and raise issues around that, then we can do that. We will be picking up on some aspects of, uh, of the issues we've touched on here in the next lecture anyway. So you know, it is just kind of flagging ideas up ready for that next lecture. But hope you all and speak to you soon. Take care.